Okay, so we are here for round three from chapter three. Um, last little bit of chapter three, the true company, that little study guide I gave you guys. Um, so, uh, in the application of the ideas of energy, right, as it relates to thermodynamics and then into photosynthesis and respiration, the last kind of piece to the puzzle here is uh, understanding the way this plays out in our ecosystems as you move up the food chain, right? So uh, a food chain is a simplified version of how energy makes its way into ecological systems uh, and then gets transferred and then eventually becomes uh, waste or heat, all right? So uh, as you guys know, energy from the sun is what's used to uh, provide food for our plants, right? So the plants use energy from the sun, use that energy so that they can convert carbon dioxide and water into glucose and oxygen, all right? Then they keep it in mind that those plants then use that energy for themselves first, but some of that energy does get locked up in the tissues of the plants or the biomass, right? Then once it's been converted to a form that can be used by other organisms, it then passes on up that food chain, right? And of course, we're losing a little bit of that heat along the way, all right? Each of these little links, right, so here, 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 and there are what we call trophic levels. All right, and so uh, one of the ways that we represent uh, this tendency of energy uh, being lost as we go is what we call ecological pyramids. And so what those do is they graphically represent the relative energy value of each trophic level, right? And it's shown in the form of a pyramid, right? And the important feature with these pyramids is that a large amount of energy is lost to, you know, use the, the air quotes around lost there because it's not technically lost, it's just uh, becomes less usable with each transfer between trophic levels to heat, all right? So we have three main types. We have what we call the pyramid of numbers, the pyramid of biomass, and the pyramid of energy, and we will talk about each of those three in turn in the next couple uh, slides here, all right? So a pyramid of numbers, I'm not gonna insult your intelligence here, uh, is just what it shows. It's a pyramid showing our producers at the bottom, and as we move on up, and it's graphically showing essentially the, the decrease in numbers as you move up the food chain, all right? Um, so it illustrates the number of organisms at each trophic level, and we should see a fairly uh, distinct drop in numbers as we move up that food chain. All right, so that's what a pyramid of numbers is just essentially showing the number of organisms at each trophic level. Now, a pyramid of biomass, uh, like the name implies, is the same structure. You should see a fairly dramatic drop in numbers as you work your way up that pyramid, okay? But it's indicating the actual biomass. So biomass is the measure of the total amount of living material, all right? Um, and we should see, of course, that, that amount decreases as you go up. And so now, uh, one thing that might uh, confuse you guys a little bit is we're talking about the total biomass at that trophic level. So we're not saying that a frog has more biomass than a snake or that a grasshopper has more biomass than a frog. We're talking about the total number of grasshoppers, the biomass would be more than the total biomass of all the frogs. And again, that's because the numbers of those organisms are decreasing as you move up the food chain. All right. And then last but not least here is that pyramid of energy, and you should notice that same uh, trend, right? As we move up the food chain, uh, there's a certain amount of energy at a trophic level. Some of that energy gets used by the organism itself, but much of that energy becomes wasted in one form or another, all right? Because of that, we end up with significantly less energy with each successive trophic level, all right? And this is important. This explains why there aren't very many trophic levels, right? Um, so we can't sustain, you know, like a, a fifth level consumer uh, because there's not enough energy available as you move up the, the food chain that far, all right? Because the, the energy loss is so great with each trophic level, we can really only support a few trophic levels, uh, you know, at, at most five, maybe I would say. Okay? Um, so, now that we've kind of gone through that, that general uh, look at what happens to the total amount of energy, numbers, and biomass as you move the food chain with each successive trophic level, 
It's important to understand that they are, those pyramids are simplifications of nature, right? Um, they don't really capture the true complexity that we see in our ecosystems. Now, they are a good model for trends, uh, but those numbers, right? So if I go back, for example, these numbers, uh, don't take those at face value. Don't, like, write those numbers down. The point is to understand the trend, okay? Um, and Because in reality, like, a food chain is way, way, way oversimplified. In reality, we have a much more complex uh, series of relationships. Um, and so a better way to show, and still we're missing some of the complexity, is what we call food web and recognizing that we don't have this simple, this organism eats this, and this eats this, and this eats this, all right? And we also have things called omnivores, right? So people, for example, are omnivores, and we uh, don't only get our energy from meat. We also eat plants, so they get our energy from multiple uh, levels, and our numbers would probably uh, be greater than some of the organisms that we eat, for example, okay? Um, so we have a simplification with food chains. Food webs are probably a better example of the complexity we have. All right. Um, and then moving into our last topic, it's time to get down with NPP and GPP, right? So GPP uh, is the, act or the, the abbreviation for gross primary productivity. All right. And so the, with the word primary there, we are referring to our producers. So the productive... Uh, productivity of our producer level in an ecosystem is what we call the gross primary productivity. So essentially, uh, the plants in a given area, right, uh, will capture a certain amount of energy and assimilate that energy. So the amount of energy brought in by our producers, so that would be plants and algae. <clears throat> so algae typically in our aquatic ecosystems, plants in our terrestrial ecosystems. So the amount of sunlight they actually capper, capture uh, through photosynthesis is what we call our gross primary productivity. All right. Now, our net primary productivity is essentially, uh, you could define it as the plant growth. So we're talking about the energy that uh, the plants don't use and then end up becoming part of the biomass. All right. So it's the rate at which um, the organic material is actually incorporated into the plant tissue for growth. Okay, so essentially you take your gross primary productivity and you subtract from that what is used for cellular respiration and what is lost as waste, and you have your net primary productivity. So uh, the actual uh, energy that ends up being locked up in the tissues of the plant, that's our net primary productivity. And the reason that value is important um, to us, I would say, is the NPP or net primary productivity is what is available as food to organisms, right? So again, you need to remember that plants photosynthesize to create uh, their their food, right? Uh, but they're using that food for themselves. They don't do it for us, okay? Uh, so they use some of that energy from uh, the food they create by using sunlight from the energy, or energy from the sunlight uh, to power their own cells and so on. But as they grow over time, remember, biomass does have energy within it, right? So the energy that's in the biomass of the, the plants is our net primary productivity, and that is what is technically available as food for the next trophic level, or our uh, what they call primary consumers, okay? Um, so this is a pretty important distinction to make, right? And then our gross and net primary productivity are going to be different based on the type of ecosystem we have, right? So for example, uh, extreme desert, rock sand of ice, and desert, semi-desert, we have a pretty low net primary productivity, okay? And that's because the climate in those areas does not allow for a lot of plant growth. Um, so even though they might get plenty of sunlight, uh, the climate and precipitation and soil types uh, keep our number of plants at a minimum, so we have very low productivity in those ecosystems. And you contrast that with our, our coral reefs, for example, and tropical rainforests, which are our most productive ecosystems, right? And that's because the climate uh, and soil types do allow for a lot of plants to grow, all right? So the more plants you have, generally that, at that producer level, the more uh, productive ecosystem you're going to have. Okay? Uh, 
So again, no surprise, our coral reefs and tropical rainforests are super, super productive. Our deserts and tundra and uh, ice shelves are very unproductive because of the low numbers of plants. All right. Um, and then the, kind of the last thing with regard to uh, uh, that primary productivity, again, the, the major lens we're going to use this entire year is how do humans affect that system. Uh, so if you look at the graphic here to the left, um, so humans, as far as, as, as an organism goes, uh, we're less than 1% of our land-based biomass, right? Yes, there's a lot of us, uh, but we make up a fairly small percentage of the total land-based biomass. Yet, the small one half percent uses uh, about a third of the available net primary productivity. Okay, um, and that is a little bit uh, astonishing. Okay, for a lot of reasons. But the, the primary one is uh, if we're using for only half a percent of the biomass, but using thirty three percent of it, that means other organisms have very little available to them. All right, and that tends to contribute to to loss of species or extinctions or uh, species becoming endangered. All right, so it does represent a threat. The fact that we use such a large percentage represents a threat to the planet's ability to support uh, humans and non-humans alike. Right? So it's not just an, uh, that this idea of ecological footprint. We have all this productive land available to us, but if humans are using all of it, that means other organisms don't have access or have very limited access. So we're going to uh, would expect to see a fairly dramatic drop in the numbers of other organisms. All right. Um, we do have a, an entire chapter kind of devoted to that uh, later in the year. All right. So uh, that sums it up. Right. Relatively short lecture this time, but the key ideas here, of course, were uh, trophic levels and ecological pyramids. Um, and then uh, contrasting kind of that simplified version with what we call food webs, which are probably a better descriptor of the complexity of an ecosystem, and then applying those ideas to the, the fundamental principles of gross and net primary productivity and human impacts on those systems. All right, uh, that is it.